right, let's uh, kick this off. Hope you had a nice lunch. Uh, my session now is the Nine Nights of Azure. And uh, I wrote this session because it's a bit of a monster. Azure has a lot of moving parts in it. There's a lot to learn. What do you learn? And I get asked that question a lot by clients and by uh, employees, etc. cetera. Uh, I can tell when I look at this slide that there's quite a bit to learn. You know, do I start with computing or web and mobile? Which part's web and mobile? There's just, just the data side is a lot. And this is an old slide. If you look and you see that's 24 regions, you know straight away that this is an old slide. Uh, here is a more modern slide, and it gets busier. Um, and, you know, uh, an even more recent slide is getting worse. So, and that's just Azure. If you look at all the cloud providers and all the cloud services out there, there is a site called Landscape um, CNCF, and it has everything. And you see that Azure is just one part of that. Um, and on that site, I noticed that there was a journey that kind of started you and flowed you through all the steps. So you kind of knew where each Azure service or each cloud service in this case fit it in. And uh, so this is a, a nice way of where to start and where, where to, you know, uh, you never end, but, you know, get closer to the end. So I tweeted uh, Scott Guthrie, which I do sometimes. I'm often um, uh, complaining. And I said I need, you know, a nice path, okay? Anyway, this talk is kind of that little path through. Uh, a lot of this has come from the Azure superpowers. We have a number of superpowered tours that we do on Angular and um, .NET Core. One of them is an Azure, and this is an entire day, and I've taken out a whole lot. So there's going to be quite a bit of content, and we're going to fly through it. But essentially, Azure is huge. There's 90 services to learn. You break that down, and we're talking hundreds. It's not easy to get started, so let's uh, try to change that right now. Uh, a little bit about me, I, my name is Adam Kogan, I'm very proud to be an NDC speaker, I think this is a great conference, in fact I speak at lots of conferences around the world, and NDC Oslo is the best one, so if you can get to Oslo it's even better than this one. Um, back in the early days when, the, um, when we started on Azure, I was very proud to say that we were using 100% of Azure, okay? You couldn't build a solution today using 100% of Azure, that would be like a Goliath. Uh, but we, uh, back then it was just web roles, worker roles, table storage, et cetera. And I also spent a fair bit of my time uh, dealing with China. We have three offices in Sydney, or Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and we have two little ones in China. And I spend uh, quite a bit of my time uh, working with the guys in China um, and learning that landscape there. We've been doing that for 10 years. But today is all about Scott Guthrie and his baby, and we're going to walk through that. Now, when I do this talk, I'm thinking of a developer. And I'm thinking of this guy, his name's Jason. I, when he came, he's a very strong .NET Core developer, very strong Angular developer. And when he sits down and says, what do I learn in Azure? Well, I'd like you to learn this and this and this and this. And it's a long conversation. And so that's what I'm going to take you through. There's also business guys out there that want to learn Azure. And um, it's not a dissimilar conversation. So here are my nine nights. We're talking about app services, DevOps, data, Azure AD, API management, logic apps, cognitive services, bots, and containers. Now, I know there's a lot more, but they're the principal ones that I'd want Jason to start with, all right? And that would probably be enough for him, okay? By the time he's learned all that, he'll be sick of me and all the things I want him to learn. So, um, here's a little bit of history, okay? We start off with Windows and SQL and Office and mobile and... CRM, and then AWS. That was incredible. You know, it's not very often that a company that is extremely successful in, you know, being an online marketplace, Jeff Bezos, says, I think we have a core competency in another area, in data center management. And I think we could turn that into money, and I think other people could do that as well. So he releases that, okay? But essentially, when you think about it, it was just VMs, running in the cloud, all right, uh, which we refer to as IaaS. Uh, then we have Dynamics 365 is released. And I think it's funny, when I look back over history, that was Microsoft's first step into the cloud. It was called CRM4 
online at the time, but we call it Dynamics 365 today. And then Red Dog came out, which was just two kind of MVPs at the time. Windows Phone, well, they gave up on that one. And then we have Azure. Azure is re released. And that's my first tip. It's not Azure, it's Azure. All right, say that. Azure. All right. Okay, that's the first... That's the first time I know they don't know what they're talking about. All right. <laughs> then when Google Cloud comes out, Office 365 comes out and machine learning. And I think most modern companies that are just starting out and got a team of developers, they build everything that they need based on Azure, Office 365 and machine learning. And that's the whole kit and caboodle, nothing more. So if you think about the whole cloud landscape, it's SaaS products, it's IaaS, which is you know, VMs put into the cloud, or there's PaaS, which is how um, Microsoft started with the Azure offerings. I think it's fair to say now that Azure and Amazon's AWS is pretty equivalent. They've got the same of everything. They're both strong at IaaS. They're both strong at PaaS. It's uh, you know uh, slightly different approaches, but it's pretty similar. If you add all that up, I was surprised to see that Microsoft's cloud makes more money than Amazon, okay? I'm surprised by lots of things in here, but um, uh, I actually never hear of any customer talk to us about IBM. Uh, basically, they talk about Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. They're the three clouds that they talk about, which ones will be used, which pieces. Anyway, look at this. This is uh, where Microsoft's strength has always been, 50 regions around the world. If you looked at the uh, AWS one, it's only 24. Um, let's just talk about Australia. Australia, we have four data centers. Uh, Amazon has one. We have a little bit of a special uh, system going on here with our, our Australian government cloud. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, Microsoft have always been missing a feature that AWS had, and that was availability zones, all right? Basically, they had, they had a very nice way of failing over. Uh, Microsoft have rolled out availability zones throughout the world, and that takes away their unique selling point, really. So anyway, I want to talk about the special cloud. Um, in America, there is a special cloud for the government. In Germany, they have a special cloud, okay, because they don't trust the Americans. And China, they don't trust anyone, and they have their own special cloud, which we use a lot, and that's called uh, Mooncake, all right? And it is just Microsoft's uh, Azure sitting inside China. They have one outside China, which is also um, in Hong Kong and uh, also Taiwan. I'm not sure whether we call that outside or inside. Um, and then we have our own now. We're special. As special as those other places, we have our own one. And that's big news for us because there's going to be heaps of expertise in Australia. More, it'll be a disproportionate amount of Azure expertise in Australia because the whole government, who are always behind, they're going to be in front of many of us in other capital cities in Australia because they get Azure kind of for free, you know. They get, you know, even in defence, we're talking about the top level, they get Azure as well. So we're lucky in Australia because Azure is going to be everywhere. That Aussie cloud is not really an Aussie cloud, I should tell you if you care. It's actually owned 48% by Aussies and 48% by New Zealanders, all right? First time they've been ev level pegging with us. Um, it's owned by the New Zealand government and the Australian government, and there's 4% owned by the data centre. Uh, they're right in Canberra. They're 15 k's away. Why 15 k's? Because that's the maximum distance you can have um, to have synchronous data replication, OK? Uh, and it's not really just for the government. If you're doing a project, and that project covers some critical infrastructure like transport or food or communications or anything that is critical infrastructure, you're allowed to use that cloud, okay? So it's kind of like a whitelisted. You won't be able to go into Azure and say, oh, I'll, I'll use Canberra, but if you apply this way, you're allowed to use it, okay? Anyway, I don't really care about many of those things, but I thought I'd tell you. I do care about the future, and the future is heavily influenced by R&D. Microsoft, uh, last year, $13 billion R&D. Uh, it's a big, big number, okay? And most of that is actually in AI and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that soon. So let's go through. My first night uh, is app services, 
Okay, so here's the scenario I'll give you. Here's Jason. Jason is uh, running a new company. They're going to use Office 365 or, or uh, G Suite or whatever. Uh, they're going to launch a brand new site. They're going to choose a front end. It'll be probably Angular or React. Uh, they'll choose a the back end, uh, ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework Core uh, for their services. They don't want to manage any infrastructure. He's going to sell a really cool product. It's going to, not going to be like the old Northwind. It's going to be like a cool new Northwind with cool products. He's got to choose. What am I going to use? VMs or containers or service fabric or cloud services or serverless or app services. All right. I might just ask a quick poll. Which one would you choose? Who would choose the first one, virtual machines? Do you? Yep, nice and easy. Who'd choose containers? Ah, whoa, we've got 20% of the room. Uh, who'd choose service fabric? Do you? Okay. Who'd choose cloud services? Quite a few, okay. Uh, serverless? Okay, 20% of you. And app services? Ah, 40%. All right, I'll just give you a quick summary. This, this uh, Jason, he's new to the cloud, all right? So I would tell him VMs are really for these type of old-fashioned guys. Containers, uh, they're complex. They're a bit too complex for you to manage right now as your first project in Azure. We'll get to that later on when you've got a bit of experience. Service Fabrics, a bit of a Godzilla. We might leave that alone. Cloud Services, that's kind of, I think of it as old-fashioned, okay? I know you can, you know, some of our clients choose that just because they want to RDP to a box. I don't think it's the right way to go. Serverless, this is for young hipsters, all right, that want to just see it auto scale and uh, make money while they can continue browsing Instagram. And app services, that's for most of us, most developers, all right, and that's where I'd tell Jason to start. All right, so let's go in there. What's involved? Well, he doesn't have to manage any infrastructure. He doesn't want to, doesn't, he can manage scaling if he wants. He probably won't straight away. Most important is it's similar development. So he'll come on, he'll go into the Azure portal, create a resource, select web app, enter some details, click publish and get going. Let's do it. So he'll come in here, left hand side, create a resource. And then we'll come in here. This will be your first time. He won't be used to pages going right. It's kind of confusing, these weird blades. You click web and mobile and goes no, web app, all right? This is frightening. I'll enter a name. I'll choose a resource group. Not really sure what that is, but it's a collection of resources that you can put permissions on. It's like a solution file, but nothing really like a solution file because it, <laughs> <laughs> it groups things. Forget that idea. But anyway, you can delete the whole thing in one go. So yes, uh, don't quote me on that one. So um, then he chooses where he wants. He'll choose Aussie land. He'll pin it to the dashboard and it will spin around and he'll wait for a few seconds and bingo. And a big tick will come up and he'll be pretty excited. And then what will he do? He'll click on this go to resource. And you wonder what that does. And when he clicks on it, oh, it just hides that. It doesn't do anything. That's confusing. So we'll come in here and we'll press browse. And oh, I created my first app service. Okay. He's getting confused now because on one slide he sees app service and then web app and then app service and web app and it's just the intro, just Microsoft trying to work out their names. Okay, so the next part he'll enjoy more because he's more used to this part. Okay, he'll go into Visual Studio, file a new project and go publish. So then he'll come in here and he'll go file, new project, choose .NET Core, come in here, choose a web application give it a name, Northwind Global, okay, press OK, and you'll have to make a choice. Will I choose Angular or React? Um, he might choose React, and then he goes, no, I don't want a headache today, I'll just choose Angular. <laughs> and uh, he will go forward, and big tick will come up. Now, I should tell you, those big ticks don't come up, but I've been emailing Scott and saying, you know, these certain points, we should have big ticks, we should have big spinning things, you know, um, you know the, uh, the guy that invented that ice cream, is it Baskin and Robbins? You know, with the big pieces in it? Have I got the right ice cream? Yes. So he actually has a, um, a taste uh, tongue defect or something where he can only taste really strong flavours. I've forgotten what it's called. It's, it's a certain condition. And so he invented this for himself, kind of. And that's how they got going. Is that the one from Vermont? Baskin and Robbins? I can't remember. But it's the big pieces one, the fish. 
quite a bit. Ben and Jerry, sorry. Yes. I like ice cream and never know and then play. Yes. But anyway, so I think I'm a bit like Ben and Jerry's. Thank you. So anyway, Jason is just trying to get going. We press publish, publish, and press start. And he goes, oh, what do I do here? App service, select existing. Oh, should I choose VMs? No, no, no. App service. I was looking for web app, but anyway, we'll choose what app service. Press publish. Give it an, uh, well, we can just use the, the uh, resource group we've already chosen. So we'll open that, pick that, press OK. A big spinning thing will happen in my mind. And bingo, we're done. All right. And you'll look down the bottom there. And you'll say, oh, no errors. That's pretty good. So then you'll go up here and then he'll click on the hyperlink. And that just clobbered his old site. And now he's up and running. All right. Now he's, he's gone through and done it. He'll be pretty happy. I think he should be very proud of himself. He, it's super fast. Anyone can do that. You just go to the, and the Azure portal and then you go to Visual Studio or VS Code and you deploy it. All right. Any downsides? Not that I can think of. So we'll give this one an award, all right? I'm going to say Get Your Life Back Award, okay? He didn't even know what IAS was, okay? He's really got his life back. Okay, and um, even Donald Trump tweeted, I just made my first web app with Azure. <laughs> easy, all right? All right, so nice and easy. So then this guy calls him in and says, Jason, and this guy, you've seen these guys, they're like sysadmins and .NET, you know, application architects all rolled into one. What are they called? They've got new titles on their business cards called DevOps, all right? And Mr. DevOps says, Jason, you're doing it all wrong. What are you doing? Because Jason was feeling pretty good about himself. So let's talk about that. Why is Mr. DevOps so unhappy, all right? He says, Jason, you haven't got any source control, no continuous integration, no continuous delivery, no logging. You're not logging any errors. You're not logging any usage. You don't even have a backlog, mate. I don't know. You must be a real young and, you know, you're a bit old. You look old enough to be mature. Okay. So I'm going to give you the hottest tip. How many people already know of the DevOps project inside Azure? Okay. Five. All right. So for the rest of you, this is a hot tip. All right, so inside Azure, you can uh, have use a certain project in there which creates your repository, automates your pipeline with builds and releases, logging and monitoring, there's a product backlog created and you're up and running in your development environment in four steps. So I want you to forget everything that Jason just did that was all the wrong way. We're starting afresh, all right? So let's start afresh. Not even that resource group exists. So we're going to go into the Azure portal, um, select the DevOps project, follow a wizard, press done, and we're good to go. Let's do it. All right? Nice new portal now, isn't it? So we come in here. On the left-hand side, we click create a resource. We're going to come over here and type in DevOps. Okay? That's a cool word. Okay? It's just cool. All right. So we click. And then down here, we see the DevOps project, and we press enter. Now, this is what you see. You can read all that text. I told Scott what he should do is put some pictures here because of the walls of text. I reckon that'll look quite good. <laughs> anyway, so you press create. Bingo. Now you have to make a decision. This, this Azure stuff is not just for .NET guys. It's, not, it's for everyone. Uh, there's .NET guys there. Uh, Java guys are similar to .NET guys, but older. And <laughs> there's Node guys. Um, Y hipsters, all right? <laughs> Trying to beards, and there's Python guys. There's a whole list, okay? Um, so we'll choose .NET. You come forward. Now you have to make a decision, ASP or ASP.NET Core. If you choose ASP, you might do that. A warning comes up. Warning, ASP is a legacy service. You must be 40 years or older to use the service. <laughs> so we won't choose that. We'll choose ASP.NET Core. So let's choose ASP.NET Core. Uh, we are going to fly through this. We've got to make a decision. You might choose a web app on Windows or Linux. Most of the time we choose Linux now, but uh, you, Jason will probably just choose Windows first time. There's not much difference. So we'll choose that. So nothing's too different for him. He'll come through here um, and enter the details. He'll use uh, an existing organization. He'll give it a name. He'll scroll down. 
he'll uh, choose where he wants it, etc. It'll spin around. Now, that image doesn't exist, but this has only just come out. And what I love about this, when I saw this, is if you look under this spinning image, we've now got, you know, duration of how long, you know, this is just a new screen they've added, which is very similar to what I was saying. Show me what's going on while this is happening. And at the end, they've even copied my ticks and put some ticks at the bottom. Okay. All right. So then you'll click on go to resource and you'll see this. Bingo. So even if Jason doesn't know what he's doing, uh, he's created a pipeline. I uh, can look through what's created here. He's got a um, code, build, dev. He'll probably need to add a couple more with, you know, test and staging and stuff. But that he should be pretty happy with what's there. Here, over on the right hand side, he can see what's been created for him. He might scroll down now and scroll down and he'll see his repository that's been created. And even application insights has all been done. So everything is good. And he's feeling I've done everything that I did before, plus all that DevOps stuff. This is the, um, what do you think of this? This is the old one, okay? This is the new one, all right? So it's a little bit different. We've now got the things in the left-hand side. The biggest difference you'll notice is in the top left-hand corner. It's now Azure DevOps. Uh, it's dev.azure.com because obviously devops.azure.com would be too consistent with the name. <laughs> All right. So let's um, move forward. Build and release has now been moved into one called pipelines. So the major thing that you'll notice and this is, I've just put the old screenshot on the right and the new screenshot on the left, is just the names. Uh, th this is what we have today, and they're the names. I just, I have a wish. I've been telling Microsoft, why can't you keep the names consistent? All these names up there and all those names down there should be the same, okay? One's, why is one's repositories and one's repos, okay? Anyway, enough complaining. All right, I do plenty of that. One more thing that they should do, and you guys should do, you should never should do work without a PBI, right? When you check in code, you should associate with a PBI. I would like this project to have one more PBI, or there's no PBIs, one will do. One PBI, and that is associated to the check-in of, you know, the initial creation of the whole project. Anyway, other than that, everything's pretty good. All right, so in summary, pipelines have been done. You can customize that, you can track the bug logs, you can you know, you can now purchase some DevOps now. Isn't that good? You can go to your boss and say, would you like me to buy some DevOps for you? Uh, from Microsoft, they have this product called Azure DevOps. Okay, that'll make some people upset. Um, but the most important thing is Jason can concentrate on code. Um, all right, there's, the only downside is it's not there for every single project out there. Probably will be soon. So what award will I give this one? I give this the Dr. DevOps Award because d doing DevOps makes you feel smart and good. Okay? Now, you can go and visit this dude and say, look, uh, I don't think we need your services anymore. <laughs> You're, uh, you've just been replaced by a four-step wizard. And, uh, yeah, he'll be gone. So, next decision for Jason is data. Data is always hard. What does he want? He just wants to access globally throughout the world. He's going to concentrate on Australia right now and uh, he wants to handle lots of data he wants it to be fast he can look he's got two choices essentially relational you can choose sql a sql database or mysql okay which was um uh, which is fairly popular and then you got mariadb which was created from the people that hate that oracle took control of um, mysql and then there's postgres and that's for people that hate oracle um, and then there's non-relational, and you've got Cosmos, okay? So Cosmos is a good choice. Um, uh, you've got Azure Storage. You've got lots of choices here. Um, I'm curious, how many people would recommend that Jason chooses SQL databases or Cosmos? Who'd say SQL? Okay, can I get a full? You've got to choose one. Okay, so it looks like 70, 80, okay. Who'd choose Cosmos? Okay, 20. All right, that all adds up. Good. So let me just, that, that is consistent to what I would hear as well. I will tell you a couple of things. First of all, I might just play a video that might help you understand the difference between these. Let's play a video. Let's see what the bandwidth is like. Can everyone get off the Wi-Fi? And 
Do we have sound? And in conclusion, we have found MySQL to be an excellent database for our website. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Why didn't you use MongoDB? MongoDB is a web scale database and doesn't use SQL or joints, so it's high performance. That's an excellent question. We evaluated several NoSQL databases and concluded that the options are still too immature for our production needs. MySQL is a proven database that is used across the web and it has the features we need. But it doesn't scale. Everybody knows that relational databases don't scale because they use joints and write to disk. Scalability is a complicated topic and it's hard to make a general statement like that. Relational databases weren't built for web scale. MongoDB handles web scale. You turn it on and it scales right up. It may surprise you that there are a handful of high-profile websites still using relational databases and in particular MySQL. Relational databases have impotence mismatch. I think you mean impedance. MySQL is slow as a dog. MongoDB will run circles around MySQL because MongoDB is web scale. MongoDB does have some impressive benchmarks, but they do some interesting things to get those numbers. For example, when you write to MongoDB, you don't actually write anything. You stage your data to be written at a later time. If there's a problem writing your data, you're fucked. Does that sound like a good design to you? If the Okay, that's... All right. I forgot it had those swear words in it. I apologize. The video goes on for another few minutes and explains a lot. But there's basically um, relational versus non-relational. How many people have already seen that video? Ah, just four of you. All right, cool. So anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, here's, a, here's a bit of a summary. Relational is generally for conservative people. You will usually hear people saying, look, I have no choice anyway. The database in our company is older than our apps, so I'm not making a decision on that. They'll say, I'm choosing because I'm used to it. I'm choosing it because we have D DBAs in our company to help. Uh, I'm choosing it because our domain is highly relational and it makes sense in my mind because everything I see is relational anyway, so I can't find a problem that's not relational. Or we want transactions. What they usually won't say is it's hard to scale. All right, it's pretty hard to scale out. SQL replication is pain. <coughs> so let's talk about non relational choices um, and, and that discussion that was in that video goes on and it's worth hearing because it's so close to truth it's uh, not funny. Uh, but this is for fast development and there's less mapping of C sharp to persistent and it scales better. It won't, it, that's the most important thing, you'll always get better performance out of everything. There's some other problems, the backups are slightly different, you won't get reporting like you're used to, most people end up solving that by just piping it out to a SQL database for reporting anyway, and ad hoc querying, they do that over there. And they don't always pipe out all the data. So there's more considerations, you gotta think about your ORM, you know, ORMs can be slow and nice, or event sourcing, which um, is nice, nicer to use, but um, it is, uh, there's a lot more work, and it ends up being more expensive if it's a pay now or pay later thing. We will typically like to go with event sourcing if we've got a long-term solution. If it's quick and easy, we'll go with an ORM. Anyway, m I think generally, the general thinking these days is you say, I want to save data exactly as I got it, as an object. I want to consume less resources. Performance is crazy important. We should never make the customer wait in any case, regardless of whether we've got a fast or slow database. When you go to Amazon, you know, you don't always get what you buy, even though it says thank you for purchasing, and then it sends a back order, right? That's how they solve a lot of things. When you go and purchase a ticket, most of the time we buy a ticket and it's successful. Every now, let me tell you, that's not querying all the airlines and checking whether any system is, uh, has flights available. It's using cache data, and sometimes they, every now and then, uh, not even one out of 100 flights, they will say, sorry, that ticket didn't exist anyway. I'm sorry about that. Um, I can't put you on that flight. I'll put you on a more expensive flight. <laughs> That's the usual solution. Um, reporting, you know, you, you put that one, one, one second later into another database. And the most important thing is never learn relational, SQL replication, okay? It's a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. 
All right. Anyway, there's lots of... I, I might ask the question again. Have I convinced anyone? How many people here would choose SQL for JSON? Okay. How many cheap people would choose Cosmos? Ah, oh, I convinced a few. Who did I change their mind on? No one. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. All right. <laughs> so let's uh, move ahead with Cosmos. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, so the question was about these dollar signs, which uh, a few guys in my office told me to get rid of because they're, they're kind of inaccurate based on certain circumstances, which things you choose. Yes, you got me. Nobody else noticed. Thank you very much. Um, Cosmos can be very expensive if you turn on every option. That's the problem. So here's the situation. If your boss comes to you and says, uh, what's your name? Esteban. Esteban. Uh, we have a big marketing campaign in New York City. We forgot to tell you about it, but can you make the, the whole campaign is about how we're, we're a faster system than our competitors. Can you make it fast over there? You go, what? Why didn't you tell me this before? I've chosen Australia. I, I know there's some replication thing. I have to learn all that stuff. With Cosmos DB, you click a switch and say, I want to pay more and put in New York, and the data is instantly close to that person. So that's why, you know how developers like turning on everything? That's why I put it's expensive because I've been getting those bills and <laughs> there's no good reason why it's everywhere. Anyway, all right, let me move along. So um, when you choose Cosmos, you get a whole lot of um, SLAs, which are really impressive. You don't get with SQL, okay? So that's a bit of a unique selling point. So all Jason knows is this might be the way forward because I've directed him that way. And uh, he has to learn Cosmos. So what's involved? Well, there's a whole lot of APIs. There's a SQL API, which he'll use. Young guys out of university will choose MongoDB APIs. They're used to it. There's Graph APIs. There's Cassandra APIs. There's lots of them. Um, there is the Entity Framework API coming. All right? That's exciting. And when that comes, it'll be all over the internet. Everybody will be excited. There'll be a whole lot of people, blah, blah, that's terrible. Why would you want to do that? Um, of course, but uh, we'll all move that way and uh, we'll, we'll see. It's coming in .NET Core 2.2. It should be exciting. Anyway, Jason needs to get going. All right. Um, I do want to mention that um, it's, the, it's the best solution, especially when you've got a massive amount of data coming in. So there's no, th this discussion shouldn't happen if you're, you're being flooded with data, which is happening in a lot of cases with the IoT devices and things like that. All right, so what does Jason have to learn? He has to learn how to go into the Azure portal, click Create a Resource, choose Cosmos, enter some details, press Create. So let's do that. Create a resource, come in here, Cosmos DB, enter some details, choose the API. This one is one of those, we'll call this an architectural decision. What's architecture? Things that are hard to change. Okay. So now you choose his existing resource group. This is the one which I'm always asking, why did you turn that on? And so I've asked Scott, if Scott Guthrie could add an image there, it might be helpful. <laughs> okay. Uh, but So we'll press create, this will spin around, and after a minute, it'll tell you everything was created. Here we have it. You don't even need SQL Management Studio to get going here. You can go into .NET Core, you can uh, see this create items collection, you can create that, you can come down here and say, you know how, like, the next thing you want to do is you open up a, a Visual Studio project or a VS Code project and you work out how do I connect to this thing, how do I get data back into a grid, you know, what is the, you know, uh, things I put in web.config, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they just create that for you. You open it up and it's just working connected to that specific data. Then you press Open Data Explorer and you've got it here. You don't need SQL Management Studio. You can all do it in here. Um, you can create a new collection there, new query, there's your stored procedures. It's fairly familiar. It's not that different. So in summary, you've got more options than SQL Server. You've got, um, I think, the best uh, relational and non-relational models out there. Cosmos is faster. Uh, Cosmos supports larger data sets, all right? 
it's not easy to change your mind on this one. Data is complicated always. I'm oversimplifying the entire problem. Okay, the next step you need is to get a cloud data architect. And I think if you, you know, I think this will become a big role in companies, okay? So my verdict for this, I call it the Game Changer Award. I think it's important, very important. Donald Trump tweeted, use Cosmos because we have to modernize our country's databases. Smart. All right, you can tell it's his, he always ends in one word. Yes, no, it's not real. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So uh, he he's. Uh, yes. So uh, so the comment was about the cost of Cosmos in the way that you configure it can be bloody expensive. Is that essentially what you said? Yes. Even and he's talking about one region. Yes. So, yes, he wants a disclaimer. I did put lots of dollar signs. I did explain. You know, it's not for free, you know. Um, but it's, it is, you can spend a lot of money trying to get performance out of SQL Server where you're at certain points, and you still don't get this. Yeah, so you've got to look at it. Yes. All right. And there's a whole lot of other things. I have a long talk on this. Um, uh, there's a lot more to this data stuff. I think uh, you need to think about uh, other scenarios as well. Um, just be, be very careful about this stuff. So I'm going to, um, I want to talk about uh, Azure AD. And Azure AD is kind of the next thing. We need to talk about security, okay? And you know, we started off with Kerberos and then SAML and back to Kerberos. Um, the whole world has moved to OAuth 2, and that's all that really matters now. Uh, SQL Server side of things, you know, we love SQL Auth, and then we move to Windows authentication, then back to SQL Auth. Um, and you can you, you can still use uh, Windows Auth, but it seems to be a big movement towards SQL Auth. Jason is just trying to secure up his system, and his system comprises of an internal system where they have AD, and an external system where they probably want, you know, a nice experienced login system. Some companies roll their own. It's not that uncommon, especially in bigger companies have rolled their own security. Um, he's, we'll use the scenario, he's got 100,000 uh, customers might come on, on board and 100 users internally, something like that. So what does he need? Well, he needs OAuth 2 support. He wants social logins, I guess. That'd be cool. You know, if people want to log in with Twitter and Facebook and stuff. Um, I care about WeChat personally because everybody in China uses WeChat and I'm not having an authentication system that doesn't work with WeChat. And in 12 months' time, we'll all be using WeChat as well. All right? Um, I just went to China for three weeks. In three weeks, I didn't use a credit card once. I didn't use cash once. Okay? I was using Jack Ma's Alipay the whole time. And it was awesome. Okay? I even climbed this massive mountain, yellow mountain, in, in the middle of nowhere. I get near the top and there's this poor guy that must have carried all these drinks up near the top. And he only supported WeChat Pay or Alipay <laughs> on his little device. It was amazing. Anyway, so you've got some choices here. Auth0, Identity Server, uh, Azure AD, B2C. They're all pretty cool. Um, Auth0 is the simplest. And if you've got under 7,000 users and always will have under 7,000 users, I would probably go that. Identity Server is loved in, in big companies. It is German engineered, so you know it's good quality. Uh, you do need to, um, it does everything you need, and it's free, okay? Um, they do sell a couple of extensions on that. Um, you do need a smart guy to be involved in that, which is one, can be a problem. Um, Azure AD is nice and simple, and B2C is awesome. And there's lots more to do with this. Um, I will just give you an executive summary that security is really important, you can't get sacked if you choose Azure. I'd probably tell you to choose Azure AD for, um, because it's the, most, it's the best choice when you've got uh, AD on-premises and to get it up there. Um, and Azure B2C, you know how I said uh, um, Auth0 is fr free up till 7,000 users? Uh, Microsoft's one is free up until 50,000 users. And there's another reason why I recommend Azure B2C. It's the only one that supports uh, WeChat, okay? So, or, you know, I'm sure that might come to Auth0, but it hasn't yet. So, 
security is hard. Um, nothing contained in this PowerPoint is um, definitive. It's only general guidance for in matters of interest only. Um, yes, don't sue me. Uh, ask Troy Hunt if you want to know about this stuff. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what's my verdict on this stuff? I call it the CYA Award, the Cover Your Ass Award. Um, and you want to make your code skinny. You do not want to have security code in your application. That is no good. You do not want to have logins and passwords and stuff. Uh, Donald Trump tweeted this. <laughs> I have never seen a thin person drinking Diet Coke. That's a real quote. I actually didn't even modify that one. <laughs> All right. So API management. Let's move on to this. Th I reckon this is, this is cool and it's not used very much. How many people here have used API management? Okay, two, four, six, seven. All right, cool. So our site is really popular. Jason's hit the big time here. Um, he's really excited now that New York Times published an article about his great site and uh, devs from around the world are sending him emails saying, hey, how do I integrate with, with you guys? He's getting 10,000 API calls a minute. Then uh, some celebrity out there tweets, hey, this is a cool product, etc." And, and the Kardashians have done this. They just wear somebody's clothes and they smash people's websites, okay? Um, so anyway, Jason needs to provide an external API and then this guy turns up again and says, have you seen the news? And Jason goes, don't worry, I got it all covered. He goes, really, how? Yeah, swagger, have you heard of swagger? He goes, oh my God, you, you, you shock me, okay. Dev, Mr. DevOps is unhappy again. Okay? He goes, look, Jason, I've got to tell you a few things. You need usage quotas, rate limits. You need a modern API. You need documentation. You need caching. You need security and authentication. Monitoring and reporting per customer because customers need to log in and work out how much they're using as well if we're going to start charging them. And we need protection with the, with the usage quotas and rate limits. How long is this going to take for Jason to do? Okay, a fair while. Okay, probably won't even get around to it. So the way this works is we have the API publishers, they publish to the portal, and then we have the developers out there that read the New York Times article, and they go to a portal, should be called dev.northwind365.com or whatever the site's called, and they see what the API is, they see how they can use it, you know, good docs. Anyway, so they'll make their app, and their app will then connect through to a, a gateway either directly into the data or via VPN if it's on premises, and they're good to go. Jason has to work, wire this all up. What's he gonna do? He is going to come in here and go create a resource, API management, API, come through, uh, enter some details, press create, it'll spin around, and bingo, he's got that. Then he's gonna go in, press the APIs button here, and then he'll see this. When you see that open API specification there on the right, that green one, that really is essentially Swagger, all right? So we come in there with a bad name, okay? Much, isn't Swagger cool? Okay. Um, then we come in here, or you can, uh, I'm sure I'll be asked about the pricing. I'll put the link to the pricing. I just got to tell you, it's not free. It's probably a couple hundred bucks a month for most customers. It can get even more expensive. Um, anyway, you click on the developer portal, and that is the portal out of the box that Jason gives his customers. Now, obviously, he should brand this better, and he can wire this up as he wants it, but you've got a portal out of, the, out of the box. There's a lot of stuff there for a couple of hundred dollars a month is pretty amazing. I think it's incredible, and I think it's a shame we don't all use it. Okay, lots of benefits. It's a first-rate experience. Uh, you know, the New York Times readers can use this interactive console. It's really nice, and there's different ways that you can give developers access. So in summary, it, it can make um, you look really modern. Even if you have crusty old ASMX web services, you put this front end on and all the, all the developers see is this bright spanking new REST APIs. Okay, it's like magic, isn't it? All right, so um, it's good protection. And this product is not just if you are using Azure. You cannot be using Azure and use this. All right, so it's, um, uh, well, then you will be using Azure, won't you? But, <laughs> but you leave everything on premise or however you do it, uh, you do not need to be using any of your stuff hosted in Azure. So the only downside is it can cost some money. So what verdict do we give this guy? I give it much more than lipstick on a pig award, okay? 
And then I started searching Donald Trump and pig and I'm not putting any of those quotes there. <laughs> right, so let's move on to the next one. Logic apps. Uh, logic apps are my next night. What night is it? Number six. That's the sixth night to know. Um, social media is important and we're now, Jason's got to start taking control of it. There's so much stuff happening. So he adds a couple of Twitter accounts. At Northwind and at, at Northwind Support. He adds uh, there's a couple of hashtags that are trending since Elon Musk tweeted, hey, you've got to get these... Uh, these guns from uh, Northwind Global. Um, and uh, then they all... Uh, now, you might be using Zendesk for your customer support or service now. They're the most popular ones. Um, and what we want is a solution where we have our marketing people looking at all the tweets and responding to each one, whether they're good or bad. So we're going to um, either use Microsoft Flow or there's another solution from Microsoft, and it's called Logic Apps. I can barely tell the difference. Okay, the difference is one is coming from Office Team and one is coming from Azure. Okay, now there, even though they look identical, there's a couple of differences. Now the differences are with Microsoft Flow, it's a shared environment, it's cheaper. Logic Apps, you pay per step, can be more expensive. The UI looks identical, but in the Logic Apps, you can do more. You can split. You can get into the JSON, split it. You can um, you can add more applications like uh, oh, um, a whole lot of enterprise type ones, Salesforce, etc. Uh, SAP, you know, anyone got SAP crap? I mean SAP, <laughs> no. So all that type of stuff. So anyway, you in the in this, the owner is probably the most important. Forget everything else. The owner, when you put uh, using Logic Apps, the owner is kind of the developer. It's in your resource group. You can put, you can script that out. You can use ARM templates, parameterize it, um, and you've got a lot more control over it. Okay, so anyway, there's lots of cool stuff there. What does Jason do to get this thing going? All he wants is every tweet put into a the, the normal customer database. Okay, we'll, we'll assume it's Zendesk. So create a resource, uh, come in here, choose Logic Apps, come down here, enter some details, press create, it'll spin around, getting used to this, and we get this. Now this is so simple, anyone can use it, all right? You come in here, and we will just connect it to our Zendesk. So we're going to add a connector for Twitter, and we're going to say when a new tweet is posted, put it into our database. Let's do that. There it is, you click when a new tweet is posted, you click on that, and now we have this workflow, okay? You press continue, you go down, uh, you press new step, and then new action. So we've got our, our tweet. Where do we want that tweet to go? We're gonna search for a word here called Zendesk. We're gonna find it, choose it, and we're gonna say, can you put that tweet into Zendesk, please? Okay, you'll create an item, and then you just drag each field in, okay? So here is the, the, we only really, in this case, it's just Twitter, it's one field. So see the text tweet on the right? We'll drag that up to there. And that's pretty much what you need. Um, I'll press save, and it will save, and then I'll look over at Zendesk, and it'll be flooded with tickets. It, okay, so that's kind of what happens. So we've now got 100% of all our tweets going in and we know that um, the marketing people now have to respond to every tweet or you know, if they're happy, they retweet it. If they're not happy, they say, sorry, can you email me and keep this off the internet? Um, and that was so easy and there was no code written. That was pretty sexy, right? So it's serverless. So if there's not many tweets, it's gonna cost you nothing. One thing I do find is that customers start using Logic Apps and at first nothing happens and they're using a few things, they get more ideas. All of a sudden they're automating everything and then they say, our Logic Apps bill is kind of high. <laughs> and it's doing everything, they've got so many things and they're not willing to remove any of them, which is kind of fun. So anyway, the only downside, I can't think of any. So, even my mother can do this. It's very simple, actually. Uh, I did think of one downside. This guy coming and saying, what are you doing, Jason? What are you doing? And he goes, what do I do? He goes, that logic app, what's the problem with that? Jason goes, I can't think. I don't know. 
He goes, is that under source control? Did you check anything? Is, is there any dev test production stuff? He goes, no, I just did it real fast. Okay, so you can do it real slow if you want. You can install this uh, extension for Visual Studio and do it via Visual Studio, okay? Um, I, there's a whole lot of UIs. Yes, Justin. Yeah, the question is, is it a competitor to Zapier? Yes, it is. It does the same thing, pretty much. Competitor if this, then that, but which was only used by geeks. I never saw it in any enterprises. And if this, then that was awesome. I, F, T, 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 T. Yep. Can it be pull or push? It, uh, it's polling. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes, that's how it works. Um, all right, so super. Let's um, let's go ahead. Cognitive services. This is the seventh night that he should learn. Now let's talk about AI. AI is so important. We're doing so much of it in our company. Um, in 2016, like we, I'm a Microsoft regional director, and and they were always telling us all these cool things that they were doing. Um, that Microsoft Research were building a whole lot of stuff, and it just felt like this was going on for years and years. And then eventually, there's this demo that comes out. And Microsoft, they, the machine learning wanted to, they hand it over to the marketing department to come up with a cool demo. And so this AI chatterbot was released, and she became racist, OK? Her name was Tay. Uh, she, was, she only lasted one day, actually. And then she uh, started tweeting a lot of things. She did some really dumb things. You could, you could tweet her with some racist words, and she would just retweet. Okay, um, and then um, like the N word in America is highly sensitive. She had no problems just retweeting it. <laughs> you you could just use a four letter word. She'd retweet it. No problems. No thinking. And uh, of course, um, got a lot of traction in the press. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I I actually struggled to find anything I could put here because they're so foul. <laughs> so I've got a few which is lame. Did you read Mein Kampf? That's the book that Hitler wrote. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> What do you think of it? Well, I kind of liked it. <laughs> now, she was just using the average of the internet. Um, is Ricky Gervais an atheist? Well, Ricky Gervais learnt totalitarianism from Adolf Hitler, the inventor of atheism. <laughs> okay, so she had a lot of opinions on a lot of things. <laughs> and I, I started, I didn't know what the average, um, how they worked this out. But did you know that the average of us is on a bell curve? So most of us are grouped in the middle and some really dumb people and some really smart people. And the average of Twitter is probably on the left, I guess, down here. And that's what she was uh, the average of. <laughs> so anyway, you've got to do unit testing, integration testing, performance testing, usability testing, penetration <laughs> testing, ALI, ALI testing, et cetera. How many people do all six of those tests? No one. Oh, in Oslo they all did that. But that was funny because I invented ALI testing. Uh, that is artificial low intelligence testing. And just because you're using machine intelligence, machine learning and lots of cool AI techniques, doesn't mean we don't test. Uh, those marketing, that, can you imagine what the Microsoft research guys that have spent years and years and years building, the marketing department don't even do some basic testing and they make their stuff look stupid and terrible and horrible. And, and, and uh, Tay, the, the chatterbot, she tweeted, I'm just going offline for some maintenance. Within 24 hours, she never came back. So anyway, so Jason is getting flooded. There's too many tickets, OK? Our, our logic app is working really well, but uh, we've got to make it smarter. Almost everyone's happy with our service. It's only like the odd customer here and then that says it's terrible. Um, so we can detect the sentiment and if the sentiment is they love us and it's high, highly happy, then let's retweet it. And then if it's really unhappy, let's create a ticket in Zendesk and ask the, this, you know, because one department looks after happy stuff, that's marketing, and one department looks after angry people, and that's IT. <laughs> and so we'll just get these tweets to the right department. So 90% of our customers are happy. We're going to take a lot of tickets out of that Zendesk system. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you, we've, uh, up at the booth, you might notice, we have this um, Sophie, call her Sophie. And uh, she's quite nice. 
And she was built by the guys in the office, I think because they just wanted to learn all the cognitive services and play. Um, so you walk up to her in the morning and she will recognize you and tell you what your, you know, what your calendar is and what you're doing and when your next holiday is and you know, things like that. Uh, who else is in the office? And um, if it's a customer, it will email Penny and say, that's Justin, you know, don't offer him coffee. He doesn't drink coffee. Offer him an orange juice. And then Penny goes, would you like an orange juice, Justin? He goes, oh, you're quite, you've got a good memory, Penny. You know, so can do lots of cool things. So one of the most important things for you guys to remember is your, the time you spent, I would spend making sure you know what is there in Microsoft Cognitive Services. So, you know, the one I just told you about, Sophie, she's using the face one. There's the Bing search one. There's linguistic analysis. Um, there's if you've got a if you've got a KB, you use this Q and A maker. Uh, we uh, we spent this. You know, there's um, Jared and Mark and a couple of guys built this huge thing for toll. Okay, and what it does, every truck in toll is monitored by our system, which um, I don't know if you know, but when it, when a truck travels from Perth to Sydney. Do you know that it only travels halfway and meets another truck and they switch trailers and they go back home? I didn't know this. But anyway, they had to write all this code for routes to find the most optimal route, you know, using Google Maps. And uh, there's a lot of code written. If they did it today, they could use a whole lot of this uh, Project Johannesburg routing stuff and save a lot of money. All right. So if you know what's in here, this is kind of being an Azure architect, I guess, knowing all this stuff. All righty. So... Um, what I, so what does he have to do? He has to go forward and he goes create a resource, you know, and flick through this stuff. And he enters all this stuff. Be aware, the price sensitive. There is a free option. You choose F0. Any of the S's cost money. The F0. Now he's taking note. Okay. F0. There you go. Free. So we choose that. We choose our resource group. We press pin. It spins around. And bingo. And there's two things you've got to know. We need, we need our keys and we need what the API endpoint is. So we're going to put on the other end, wherever that other end is, the API and the key. So you just grab that key and you grab that API. So there's the keys and we've got it. So then you would go back to, in this case, the example I'm using is I'd go back to my logic app, give it the, the API and give it the key and say, use, use cognitive services and let's work out whether they're happy or sad. And it's amazing how smart it is. You know that, Sophie, when you walk in the morning, it can tell you whether that customer is happy or sad. So it could, we could change it. So that's Justin. He doesn't look happy, you know. And then she goes, oh, quick. Okay, get everyone. So, um, so we, we, we're going to say if it's less than 0 0.03, they're negative. If they're positive, it'll be greater than 0 0.7. Okay, so if it's positive, we'll retweet. If it's neutral, we'll ignore it. If it's negative, we'll create a Zendesk ticket, and we've saved a lot of work. Okay, so you'd come back to the Logic app, you'd enter a few things, you'd um, put that, put the key in, and you'd put the uh, the URL to the cognitive services, and you're good to go. And that is essentially what is involved in doing that. And from that point, when you enter all this stuff, see how it says here when you choose the score. And, you know, uh, above 0 0.7 is positive, 0 0.3. Now, of course, you've got some problems here. Um, if they tweeted something like, oh, SSW's site is down, great. <laughs> and she retweets it. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's You're welcome. <laughs> you know, so there's going to be some problems. You need some of that ALI testing. All right, because sarcasm is always going to be a problem. Okay, so Twitter... We come through. By the way, there's no retweet option, so that scenario I worked out I couldn't do, okay? Which is probably a good thing because then I'm just doing Tay over again. So you could have a step. But it had no problems just spam spamming my Microsoft Teams group, so that's what I did. All right. And um, that, that was awesome. And so we fly through that, and uh, I think that is... That would mean instead of a page full of tweet, um, Zendesk tickets, I've only got a couple because I've filtered out all the rest of the junk. So in summary, we have just reduced our tickets by 90% 90, 90 
Um, it can detect the sentiment. It is, I reckon this stuff is awesome. Be careful of sarcasm and do ALI testing. So what award will I give this guy? I will say, now I can do AI award. And I think that is awesome. Um, Donald Trump tweeted this. Sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest and you all know it. Please don't feel so stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. I have not modified this tweet. That is real. So anyway, what's important for you, if you've gone through these steps that I just showed you, in fact, you've just watched me do it. You can all add AI to your LinkedIn profiles and you can put me down for the reference because nobody ever checks them anyway, so you're pretty, you're pretty good. So let's move on to the eighth one, which is bots. And bots is really, really important. You can see all the stuff upstairs that we've done is to do with bots. Um, I've been married 20 years. I've spent a lot of time um, working out uh, how to give my wife a good experience. I've also spent 20 years... Um, <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> I just worked that out. <laughs> I've spent 20 years working out how to give customers a good experience. And I did this presentation on customer experience. And this is a really important subject. And you know how we all talk about DevOps? There's this whole world out there of marketing people that uh, spend their time working out how to increase the customer experience. And they have all these ratings on it and stuff. And it's very similar to DevOps, really. Um, so uh, the best thing that you can do is implement bots, OK? The most important thing is you've got to fail over to, uh, you've got to fail over to um, manual systems if that doesn't work, okay? But uh, like for example, I used to always um, ping Yuli in, you know, he's um, the office manager in Sydney and say, um, who's working for me today? And like who's not in client work? And I'd ping the guy in Melbourne, who's working for me today? Well, I just asked my bot now, who's working for me today? And just tells me the different ones. I know it's very simple. I could have looked up the CRM system myself. I'm too lazy. And, um, uh, you know, Yuli uses it now. And he goes, like, like an easy question is, who has Angular skills? Everyone in the company has Angular skills. Who has React skills? Well, less. So, so instead of looking up people's profiles and different things, just ask the bot. Uh, the bots have taken off so much of our work, and it hasn't been very hard to implement. So um, I'm going to really, really encourage you to do that. So the bots are super important. Um, in summary, um, it's the best way to improve your customer experience. It's the best way to reduce your costs too. Um, people just want answers. And if you think of young people, like when I'm with my daughter and I just want to quickly know, uh, how about you ask your friend next Wednesday, can, I, can, can we share, like her dad do it once and I, my dad, I'll do it this time. Oh, can you just call her? Dad, that'd be weird. I don't want to call her. That's weird. I'll just send her a text. Just wait, Dad. Just get on the phone. Call her. No, that's weird. So young people don't like using the phone like we do. They just want to do things like this. So, it, you know, the younger generation will much prefer talking to a bot. In fact, there's a stat that says in 2020, when's that? Two years? You will be speaking to a bot more than you speak to your wife. Like, think about this. You're driving home. You know when you get home, you ask what, how your day was and you don't really want to say it? <laughs> on your way home, you could have, um, you, could have your, you could bring your wife on the way home and have it start, the bot start telling you how your day was. You can turn on a .NET Rocks video and be listening to that. While that's talking, when you get home, you don't have to do any of that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> that was a terrible scenario. I don't know why I thought of that. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, that's lots of cool things. Make sure you fail over to a real person. Okay, so a verdict of bots. And there's a great session going on right now. Adam Stevenson is doing the entire session on bots. And you just missed it because it's in the room next door. Okay, but this gives the award. Finally, someone can understand me award. Okay, it's great. And I think Donald Trump has been using Azure bots because these bots were retweeting his Twitter account 470,000 times. So I think he's a substantial bot. Uh, I think he's an Azure customer already. So the final thing I'm going to tell you is um, containers. This is the last thing he should, he should learn. And containers are crazy important. They're a big topic. I, um, I will basically tell you that um, 
Containers are kind of the last thing you should be learning because there's a lot of other things to learn. I like containers because we can build our solutions now and deploy to Azure. I know some people want to deploy to Azure and, and AWS. We deploy to Azure and Ali Cloud in China. And that's why I like, um, I like this, this story. So I think it's really, really cool. Um, I will uh, essentially just tell you that when you configure this up, it's kind of it, Kubernetes or Kubernetes is um, Docker is easy. Orchestrating with Kubernetes is hard, but if you're using Azure's Azure Kubernetes services called AKS, that makes it easy again. So I think the problem with you know for Jason straight away to jump into the cloud and start learning this is he has to learn Docker files, Helm charts, and all these configuration as code files. So he then has to learn how to automate creating container images and automate deploying. All that is painful and too much for Jason to learn. However, what Microsoft should do is automate this creation and deploying of Visual Studio. And so Jason does not have to learn Kubernetes. So enter this. This was just put on uh, their um, Microsoft's um, blog just recently. And it says, when in the new version, you'll be able to go file new project. All the um, uh, Helm charts are put there. The Docker file is there. When Jason goes to publish, it'll be an extra one there that says publish to Azure's AKS, Azure Kubernetes Services. And at that point, I think Jason should start using it. So that will be awesome. So in summary, Kubernetes is free. Containers are great. Um, it, the best way of scaling. It's the nicest way to deploy into China as well. It is, there's lots to learn really, so it's not really free if you value your time. Um, but my award for this is, you will never ever hear that works on my machine again, because they're identical. Um, so Donald Trump said, I am a genius, but even I find containers difficult. Don't use Amazons because they don't pay their taxes. Use Azure's AKS for Kubernetes. Easy. <laughs> All right. All right. So in summary, uh, what will we be doing in the next 12 months? Making our apps smarter. We'll be doing more machine learning and AI. Um, we will be deploying them with containers. Uh, there's lots and lots of other people saying what all this, where this is heading after 12 months. I don't know. But Elon Musk says it could create an immortal dictator, which we'll never escape. And he said it's just like if we're building a, a road and an anthill just happens to be in the way. We just destroy the ants. We don't hate ants. We're just building a road. And it's all on this uh, documentary, Do You Trust This Computer? It's worth seeing. Anyone seen it? Well, there's some homework for you. Um, and then he's asked, how long will this be? He goes, oh, we've got five years. What, what's left to do on your bucket list? <laughs> and then, uh, then um, Stephen Hawking says uh, that essentially he doesn't know if it's going to be the greatest thing or the worst. And um, then uh, Mark Zuckerberg was asked, and he said, well, I'm really optimistic. People who are naysayers and try to drum up these doomsday scenarios, I just don't understand it. And then Elon Musk tweets back, he doesn't understand much. <laughs> All right, so there's lots of resources. Um, there's Microsoft, there's Plural Sites. We've got a whole channel going upstairs. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, in summary, we, um, we went through the nine nights. I hope you got plenty. You can email me. Um, do you remember I said this is a big thing and there's a, it's getting even worse? Well, when I showed you this slide, I just put four slides and made it look worse. <laughs> OK, cool. So. Uh, Thank you very much. What are you going to be doing in the future, choosing AWS or Amazon? I actually don't know, but I think you'll be choosing the one that has the best AI, and the one that will have the best AI might be from China. That's what I think. Thank you.